Thank you for joining us for the Gene Convene Global Collaborative's webinar series around a theme, Gene Drives, the State of the Research. My name's Dave Obrachta, and I'm a member of the Gene Convene Global Collaborative team, and your host and moderator for this series of webinars focus on some of the technical aspects of the research and development of engineered gene drives, along with my colleague, Hector Kumada. Before we get started in today's, with today's speaker, let me tell you a little bit about Gene Convene Global Collaborative, a little bit about the webinar series that we're, we're gonna be taking part in today, and uh, a little bit about what we have planned for, for later in the webinar series. The Gene Convene Global Collaborative is, is an initiative within the Foundation for the National Institutes of Health. It has arisen from and is an extension of FNIH's long involvement in the vector-borne disease space. The potential for genetic biocontrol and gene drive technology specifically to contribute to the reduction and even the elimination of human malaria, for example, as well as other urgent public health challenges is substantial. The responsible exploration of these technologies is critical in order to see if in fact these technologies can fulfill their potential. GeneConvene, among other things, seeks to offer accurate information, advice, and technical support for the purposes of fostering responsible approaches to research and governance of gene drive and other genetic biocontrol technologies for public health. GeneConvene also works to advance the safe, ethical, and rigorous exploration of gene drive and other genetic biocontrol technologies. It does this by trying to anticipate emerging issues and to facilitate the development of guidance and best practices through consensus building. I encourage you to learn more about GeneConvene Global Collaborative by visiting uh, the GeneConvene website at fnih.org forward slash GeneConvene. Let me also point out to you the Gene Convene Virtual Institute. It's a component of the Gene Convene Global Collaborative. The Virtual Institute's a knowledge resource that aggregates, tracks, organizes, and shares the latest gene drive from scholarship, research, to media reports, to policy, and regulatory documents. The Virtual Institute is striving to create a resource where those interested in gene drive and genetic biocontrol can come and learn about what's happening and what has been happening. The gene drive research space and associated scholarship has resulted in about two scholarly publications a week during the year of 2020 that have directly concerned gene drive. Media coverage of gene drive and other genetic biocontrol technologies had been at least as active. So to help keep up with this activity, the Virtual Institute publishes a weekly newsletter that notifies you of this new scholarship, new media reports, et cetera. Check it out. Also encourage you to follow us on, uh, on Twitter and, and Facebook. Let me say something about this webinar series. This particular series of six seminars is focused on the science and is intended to provide researchers an opportunity to share their latest results and to receive feedback and discussion from others. While this series is limited to six researchers in a growing field of, of gene drive research, we'll be coming back to this technical theme in later webinar series, and we'll have an opportunity to hear from others who are doing important research in this area. Immediately following this particular webinar series will be another webinar series that takes on the theme of regulatory and policy considerations around engineered gene drives. This is a schedule of the, of the upcoming webinars and this series of topics. We won't have a webinar on, 11, uh, on October 11th nor on October 25th, but we'll have five other webinars interspersed within there at these particular, uh, on these particular topics and at this very same uh, time and place. We'll give you more details about the speakers and where to register for that uh, uh, probably next week. Before we get on to introducing today's speaker, let me just give you a little bit of orientation about today's uh, webinar. If you're having any technical issues regarding uh, the Zoom presentation, 
Our event staff, Tara and Dietria, are behind the scenes here helping us, and you can email them with any technical uh, problems that you are encountering at events at FNIH.org. The presentation today is scheduled to be approximately 50 minutes. I encourage you to ask questions, and you can do that using the chat function uh, associated with the Zoom platform that you're, uh, that you're on currently. I encourage you to ask those questions as they come to you during the course of this, the seminar. We'll address those questions at the end of the seminar, however, and, um, and we'll end uh, the seminar at, uh, at about 90 minutes. If there are any remaining questions, we can address those offline. This presentation will be recorded and we'll post it uh, at, uh, on the Gene Convene Virtual Institute at the website shown below. Great, well, it's, it's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, George Christofides from Imperial College. George is a professor of infectious diseases and immunity in the Faculty of Natural Sciences uh, in the Department of Life Sciences. He's also an adjunct professor and associate dean at the Cyprus Institute in Cyprus, where he is actually at this very moment. George has spent a large portion of his research career investigating the immune system of malaria transmitting mosquitoes. And I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot about that today and the interactions between those malaria causing parasites and their mosquito vectors. To this day, he continues to make insightful discoveries into this really complex and important and intimate interaction. George has also been intimately involved in the creation of a number of seminal genomic resources for mosquitoes over the last decades that really have laid the foundation for the sophisticated genetic analyses of Anopheles gambi and other mosquitoes that are possible today. I could go on, but let me finally mention that George is, has generously served as the mosquito, genetics research the mosquito genetics research community by ensuring that the biannual meeting of mosquito molecular and population geneticists is convened at Columbari, Greece. This meeting has served as a critical nexus for the community and thanks for being a generous citizen, George, for, uh, for, for organizing this over the last number of years. So good morning, George, from Washington, DC, and good evening to you in Cyprus. Thanks for joining us. And at the end of your long day, uh, are you ready to go? Uh, hi, David, uh, I'm already here. Hello. Let me share. Okay, let me give you the ball and, and the floor will be yours. So let me stop sharing. Let me know when you have your presentation up and I'll tell you that we can see it. Great. I can see it. And you're good to go. All, all set, David. Is it can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Hear you good. You're you're all set. Okay, uh, thank you again, uh, and uh, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present to the community uh, our work uh, on uh, towards uh, uh, converting malaria vector mosquitoes into non vectors uh, by uh, uh, population replacement. And I will talk more about the minimal genetic modification concept that uh, we introduced uh, in the past uh, few years. Uh, let me actually um, see whether I can transition uh, and I will stop my video so we can all focus on the slides. So um, the, uh, the concepts that we have been following in the past uh, 15 or so years uh, stem from this diagram that many investigators, many colleagues have uh, contributed in, in producing, uh, and you have seen several versions of that. Uh, this schematic here says that within the mosquito, uh, and you can see this black line uh, uh, here, uh, the parasite population suffers, goes through a major bottleneck. Uh, and especially at the transition between the Orkhine stage which is the zygotic stage in the mosquito midgut uh, of the malaria parasite. Uh, at the Okani stage, uh, 
um, there is uh, a, a huge reduction of parasite numbers. And until the parasite reaches the other side and transforms to horses, uh, the, um, most of the parasites are lost. Or, uh, uh, so we have most of the mosquitoes carry no parasites and very few mosquitoes carry very few parasites. So we have this bottleneck of the parasite numbers that is created here because at the oocyst stage where we have a genetic, we have a vegetative growth of the parasite. So mitotic divisions, again, um, within a protected environment, the oocyst has a capsule. So the environment is rather protected there. Uh, the parasites multiply uh, significantly and the numbers recover. Of course, we have a second bottleneck afterwards, which is the transition between, from the oocyst that is forming on the, um, on the gut epithelium, on the outer side of the gut epithelium, on the uh, uh, hemolymph side, uh, 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 and until uh, we, the parasites reach the salivary glands uh, of the mosquito, we have another bottleneck, especially uh, 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 in, the, in the speed of the mosquito, uh, in the saliva of the mosquito when it bites, only very few parasites can make it to the human, and uh, then they will reach the liver. So um, from the beginning, since I was a, a postdoctoral uh, fellow with uh, Fortis Cafatos, we uh, focused on understanding uh, what this bottleneck is made of, how is it created. And um, one of the systems that we uh, uh, investigated was, was the mosquito immune system. Uh, there were several evidence from previous work by Frank Collins, Ken Burning, and others that the mosquito immune system may be uh, 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 very important in, uh, in killing malaria parasites in the, in the mosquito gut and after that as well. So, um, and I'll, I'll show you several slides in, the, uh, in my presentation uh, that will uh, uh, highlight the fact that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the immune system of the mosquito plays a major role in creating this bottleneck. If we abolish the, um, the immune system, it would compromise the immune system of those mosquitoes. The bottleneck here disappears. And uh, towards the end of this first part of the presentation, I'll uh, show you that parasite uh, shows tolerance uh, to this immune response uh, a mechanism that we call evasion, parasite immune evasion, um, although I would mostly prefer to uh, call it tolerance or resilience or endurance of parasites. Um, and if we compromise these immune evasion or uh, tolerance mechanisms, then the parasites cannot survive uh, anymore. They are killed by the mosquito immune system. So this is an overview of uh, what we know today uh, about uh, the uh, happenings in the mosquito gut. Uh, so here's a schematic that shows the gut epithelium. Uh, you can recognize the, uh, the single layer of epithelial cells here with the luminal side uh, and the basal side. Here is the gut lumen in the uh, gut lumen uh, similar to uh, what happens in the intestine of other animals, uh, we have a very complex ecosystem that is formed from uh, uh, of, uh, bacteria, uh, protozoa, uh, fungi, uh, viruses, and this ecosystem is in homeostasis. Uh, in this homeostasis, the mosquito immune response has a role, so there are constant responses uh, by the epithelial cells, mucosal immunity, and it keeps the, uh, these microbes at bay. It keeps, uh, 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 it provides colonization resistance. So some, some very uh, uh, nasty pathogens, uh, microbes will not multiply. They will be kept under control. And uh, all this is in homeostasis. Here on the other side, uh, you see the uh, hemolymph of the mosquito. Uh, where we have hemocytes circulating, essentially waiting for systemic 
uh, uh, infection that will happen upon uh, in with uh, breaches of the epithelium or of the epidermis that was on the other side. All this changes when the mosquitoes take a blood mill. And let's assume that this blood mill is infected with uh, enhanced malaria parasites in there. So the first thing that happens uh, after the blood mill is that the bacteria mostly, uh, presumably other microbes as well, uh, multiply traumatically, uh, tens to hundreds of folds uh, within a few hours. So by 18 to 24 hours after the blood meal, uh, we have the peak of the microbial load uh, in the mosquito gut lumen. And this obviously dis disrupts, disturbs the homeostasis. Uh, in response to that, the uh, mucosal immune system of the mosquito that derives mostly from the epithelial cells reacts, and we have very robust responses um, that target the, those uh, uh, microbes uh, by enzymes, antimicrobial uh, 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 peptides, and many other molecules. And this control springs back together with some other processes that I will not go into, into the detail uh, uh, here. Um, they will bring back the microbial load to uh, all the, the whole system into homeostasis again. If the uh, blood meal is infected with malaria parasites, then those parasites uh, are caught within this uh, interaction, this fight, but it's, it's rather an interaction because both systems benefit from that uh, and many of them are killed. Uh, parasites are also recognized directly by the mosquito immune system when they're present in the gut. And there are some specific or non-specific immune responses that contribute to this massive immune response that happens against bacteria. So many parasites are killed. Some of them and some mosquitoes survive and they traverse the gut epithelium to go to the other side and become horses. There, uh, as soon as they emerge from the basal side of the gut epithelium, they will face the hemolymph immunity orchestrated mostly by the hemocytes and the fat body. Uh, the most important uh, uh, module of the hemocyl of the systemic immunity is the complement-like system, which I will, I will talk about in, uh, in some more detail in the next slides. So many parasites now, the majority of parasites are killed by this systemic immune response. And only very few parasites in very few mosquitoes will be able to survive and become horses. Uh, this is again an overview of um, what we know today, uh, uh, thanks to the, uh, the, uh, the research of many of the community, of many of our colleagues, and our lab as well uh, about the, uh, the interactions that are happening and concern the mosquito immune response. And is, I, I must say is not even up to date. I mean, I, I couldn't really populate with all that we know. It's just to show you that since the discovery or the, the dissection of the mosquito genome uh, in 2002, uh, there has been a tremendous progress in understanding the, the immune uh, response uh, of uh, anopheline mosquitoes. I, I can just take you through some of the uh, uh, modules that we see here to interact with the malaria parasite one way or another, either directly or indirectly. Uh, we have hormonal regulation, we have a, a, a small peptides that are produced and they uh, influence the uh, uh, promote the uh, expression of hormones, uh, including the juvenile hormone and 20 Dyson, and these will stimulate immune responses, which will be uh, directed against the malaria parasites. We have major uh, 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 module of immune signaling by uh, mostly two pathways, the IND and FKB pathway uh, of insects, uh, in this case mosquitoes, and uh, by the JNK, this, the, the, uh, the JNK pathway, the junk pathway, uh, when the parasites go through. 
Uh, we have homeostasis responses, as I said before, which are orchestrated by receptors that are secreted in the, uh, in the gut lumen. And again, they turn on uh, immune responses. Uh, we have the uh, 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 neuro uh, brain axis uh, uh, operating here with a neuropeptide and a gustatory receptor uh, being involved in recognizing whatever is happening with uh, this disruption of homeostasis, and again, sending signals to uh, uh, react and bring homeostasis back to where it was, or bring the system back to homeostasis. Uh, we have cell defenses that are uh, 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 operating in the uh, epithelial cells. When the parasites go through, they cause major disruption, uh, wounding of the epithelium, uh, and death of epithelial cells that must be repaired. Uh, and uh, we have a very complex, I, I hear only list a few molecules, uh, of, uh, a very complex network of cellular defenses, uh, uh, mostly uh, uh, working through the actin filaments, uh, which also uh, restrict malaria parasites from exiting the epithelium. We have this major system uh, of systemic reactions that we call the complement-like system, which is similar to the vertebrate complement system. Um, uh, we have a, a, a crosstalk, a um, signaling between uh, the uh, reproductive machinery of the mosquito uh, via the, um, the hormones, via 20, via 20 Dyson, uh, uh, and the, uh, that interacts with the immune system again, and there is a balance how much energy should be put in the, on, on the immune response and uh, on, uh, on reproduction. Uh, and we have, as I said, several others. You will see here some also um, uh, red molecules, I mean molecules highlighted in red, which are the parasite molecules, and I will come back to this in a couple of slides. This is uh, some more uh, detail on how the complement system, which is very important for the presentation that I will, uh, I will sh show today for my talk today, uh, how the, the uh, complement system works. Um, it mostly relies on a uh, protein that we call TEP1. TEP1 is a C3-like molecule for those of you who uh, no vertebrate immunity, C3 is the central molecule that uh, um, orchestrates all the rest of the uh, complement related responses like MAC complex formation, phagocytosis, uh, etc. Um, so, this equivalent is analogous to uh, the C3 uh, molecule uh, factor of complement, not evolutionarily, but functionally analogous. TEP1 is a uh, circulating in the hemolymph of the mosquito uh, in, uh, uh, together with a complex of um, a receptor, uh, of receptors, a receptor adapter complex. Uh, upon recognition of the parasite, which we don't know exactly how it happens, but uh, we understand that it mostly uh, concerns recognition of damaged parasites. Uh, then the TEP1 is released from this complex. It binds on the parasite. There it forms another big complex. I only show a few molecules there uh, with uh, uh, various regulatory activities, either uh, suppress suppressor activity or promoter activity that will, uh, that is called the, the, the TEP1 uh, convertase. The TEP1 covertase will uh, convert more TEP1 into active TEP1, will bind on the parasite surface, decorate the parasite. And you can see here some parasites on this uh, image on the, on the right. You can see several parasites invading the gut epithelium. And uh, TEP1 is um, marked with, uh, the, uh, with the red color. And you can see that some parasites are fully uh, 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 decorated by uh, TEP1, and those parasites will be killed. Uh, the preferred killing method will be lysis of the parasites, and we have evidence that this happens 
in a, system, in, a, in a way that is similar to the MAC complex. So TEP1 inserts itself and other molecules insert themselves in, on the parasite membrane and they open pores and these parasites are lysed. Uh, this is the default mechanism, but in some mosquitoes and under, uh, in some circumstances, some conditions, uh, the, uh, these parasites may be also melanized. And uh, that was uh, one of the iconic, some of the iconic uh, 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 pictures that we got from early uh, work, as I said before, of Frank Collins and Ken Vernick, and especially Frank Collins with regards to, uh, uh, to melanization, where we had mosquitoes that, uh, that fully melanize all the parasites when they go through uh, the gut. And some of us working with anophilines still have these strains in their lab. Uh, then uh, we have um, other modules that are operating at the same time that regulate the entire uh, process. So back to the parasite molecules, I told you uh, at the beginning that now in the past like five to seven years, we know that parasite molecules uh, uh, that are found on the surface of the parasites, mostly on the surface of the okinids, uh, serve uh, uh, play a role in evading the mosquito immune response. What we understand today, what I understand today from the work we have been doing in the past few years, essentially uh, most of these molecules, and I will show you some uh, results uh, later on, most of these molecules have a generic role in protecting the parasite and they don't have any specific role in interfering with the immune response. Um, and you can see those molecules, for example, when the parasite goes outside uh, and exits the epithelium, uh, we have several molecules either secreted like this CO1 molecule or on the surface like the P47, C43. I will talk, to about, we'll talk about that later, uh, that protect one way or another, protect the parasite uh, from mosquito complement reactions. Uh, how did we start understanding this uh, evasion uh, uh, machinery uh, that came from the seminal work of our colleague uh, Carolina Barillas Murray, uh, which identified or discovered that a molecule that was previously thought to play, play a role in parasite fertilization uh, is able to evade or serves. Uh, the role of evasion of parasite immune evasion. And what Carolina and her colleagues proposed, uh, uh, found and, and then proposed uh, this theory uh, of the, the key and lock. Oh, let me go back, get rid of that. Uh, the key and lock theory of malaria transmission is that there are various alleles of these molecules circulating in parasite populations, in plasmodium falciparum populations. Uh, across the globe, uh, and that these alleles, in order to function, to unlock or uh, the um, the evasion mechanism, they need to interact with specific alleles of uh, the mosquito. So we have structured alleles of the locks and structured alleles populations of the key, which is the P forty seven. So the theory says that uh, mosquitoes, uh, which pre-existed uh, 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 the parasite in the, uh, in, uh, uh, I mean, the, the geographic distribution of parasites uh, were uh, separated when the uh, Pangaea separated and inhabited the various continents. Uh, this led to disruptive selection of these locks, which we don't know what they are. Uh, so we have specific alleles of this lock molecule in South America, other alleles in, uh, in Southeast Asia, different alleles in, in Africa. Uh, the parasite that jumped from the primates, other primates to humans, uh, were able to be transmitted through this one allele in Africa, then with the slave uh, uh, trade, uh, we had directional selection uh, of the par and parasite introduction into other continent continents in order for the parasites to be transmitted by these new populations now that have a different allele of the lock 
they had to uh, undergo directional selection adaptation. And that's how we have this compartmentalization and geographic distribution of, uh, of uh, malaria transmission. So at the same time as uh, uh, Carolina were, and her colleagues were making these discoveries, we have been working with uh, the Rodin uh, model parasite, Plasmodium bergei, and we had similar observations. So this molecule, the P47, which uh, we knew that is involved in uh, fertilization, and you see here the gametocyte to or kinid conversion rates uh, in wild type parasites and parasites that are lacking this P47 molecule. You can see that we have a huge reduction of parasite numbers of uh, all kinds of uh, numbers of the rate of, uh, uh, of this conversion. Uh, we observed that uh, these parasites, when we silence these knockout parasites, when we silence the, uh, the complement system, the mosquito, and you, you see here silencing of one of the molecules, uh, of one of these receptor adapter uh, uh, molecules, the LB1, and here of the C3 molecule, the TEP1, uh, then these parasites can now be transmitted. So you see here in the control that the uh, knockout parasites uh, are uh, cannot formosis, but a few, uh, but when we uh, inactivate the complement system, then we have a huge increase of the number of parasites of the oogosis and transmission uh, of parasites back to mice through mosquito bites. So this is how this molecule was P47 uh, through this work of, uh, from this work of Carolina and, and ourselves uh, uh, was designated as a parasite immune evasion uh, key molecule. You can see that, uh, so P47 plays this dual role uh, on fertilization. It is found on female gametocytes and you can see that here or uh, a plasmodium, both plasmodium bergei and plasmodium falciparum. Here I show you bergei. Uh, and it's also found on the surface of uh, the eukinids. Here it plays a role in fertilization between male and female parasites. There on the eukinid plays a role in protecting the eukinid from the mosquito immune system. So in an effort to find, to identify more molecules that are involved in uh, parasite host mosquito interactions and mostly targeting, try to identify molecules that are involved in, uh, in uh, uh, resistance of parasite to the immune response. Uh, we did what we knew best to do, which was to uh, have a, do a transcriptomic study, uh, several transcriptomic studies in fact, uh, in different vectors, for example, here you see Anopheles gambiae and Anopheles uh, arabiensis, um, both in, uh, uh, in mice, in, in, plasmo in uh, mice infected with Plasmodium bergei, and in parasites that were uh, collected from humans directly uh, uh, from uh, patients uh, in Cameroon, Burkina Faso, uh, later Uganda, uh, and uh, so we infected our mosquitoes with those parasites and we took uh, samples at several time points. Here you see six hours, 10 hours, 24 hours. We had some more time points. We also did plasmodium vivax in, uh, in Brazil. All these results were combined and uh, they showed that, uh, well, we produced from those results, we produced a list of genes that are expressed in the, at the stages of interest, which are the zygotes uh, and okine stages that interact with the mosquito gut. And um, they are predicted to be either transmembrane uh, proteins uh, so that they can interact with the, the, the environment or are secreted or are GPI anchored. So we had a list of about 150 to 200 such molecules on the uh, parasite surface. And then uh, we had to uh, uh, do genetic uh, uh, screens to understand what these molecules are doing. Of course, it's very difficult and time consuming. It would take us uh, uh, tens of years to screen all these 150 
molecules with uh, disrupting them all one by one. So we had to devise a genetic screen to do that. Uh, the genetic screen was uh, and is very complex. The, re the, the reason for that is that the parasite during the stages of interest, which is the uh, zygote and the orchinid, are diploid. So if you cross parasites to, uh, for your genetic screen, then you will have complementation and, um, and you will lose the phenotype that you need. So we had to uh, 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 we put our ingenuity and, and, and our knowledge there and we devise a screen where uh, we are targeting uh, genes that are haploid sufficient, uh, links that are haploid sufficient, uh, uh, or uh, function at uh, uh, stages that would not have an impact on the, uh, on the phenotype that we needed. And um, we pulled, uh, so that was, that was a signature type mutagenesis. Uh, so these genes were disrupted and this disruption was marked with a signature, a genetic and genomic uh, signature. Uh, we pulled all these parasites and now we were able to do uh, STM, signature type mutagenesis screens, similar to those that are happening in yeast and other organisms uh, uh, in parasites. So we are we're pulling the parasites and we're infecting the uh, mosquitoes uh, in mass. Uh, and then we were monitoring what goes in, what goes out uh, of the mosquito at various stages uh, using uh, next generation sequencing. So we we're performing dropout and enrichment screens uh, uh, in those mosquitoes and in mosquitoes that had different genetic backgrounds. For example, mosquitoes that are uh, have their complement system silenced and uh, see whether we have any change from the wild type mosquitoes. Uh, I will not go uh, through each one of those uh, uh, molecules, but you can see here a sample of a genetic screening that was a pool of about 50 or less in this case um, uh, mutants. And uh, we're monitoring what happens, for example, let's, let's take this one here, which is the C43 molecule, which I will talk about later. You see what happens in uh, wild type mosquito when this mutant parasite goes through the wild type mosquitoes and when it goes through immunocompromised mosquitoes uh, with gastrosis or with gastrosporozoids. So we're able to identify here molecules that are playing an important role in the interaction between uh, mosquitoes and parasites and uh, of those uh, were selecting molecules that play a role in, uh, in protecting the parasite from the mosquito immune response. So most of these molecules, I mean, what we, uh, what we know today um, after, so we selected these molecules, I mean, let me say that first, and then we went in a more uh, rigorous uh, uh, um, screen one by one, understanding what they really do. And I can say that most of these molecules, and you can see here a, uh, a snapshot of those results, most of these molecules have dual roles. They have a developmental role as well as uh, uh, in addition to protecting from mosquito, from the mosquito immune response. Um, you can see here again, the, the, the gametocyte to kind of conversion rate of Plasmodium bergei. Here's a wild type, we have almost 80% conversion. Here is the P47 that I told you before. It has a 20, almost percent conversion. You can see a different molecule that we know is involved in fertilization. It has like five to 10% conversion. Uh, um, and uh, so most of them are involved in, uh, in developmental processes. Uh, nevertheless, some parasites do survive, even in those that have a very strong phenotype and they invade the mosquito gut as you can see here. However, uh, almost none of those parasites produce uh, uh, oocysts or they produce very little oocysts compared to the control. And you can see this both on this graph here, as well as on these pictures more clearly, uh, which are representative pictures from the guts of those mosquitoes. So they do invade, but then they are killed again by the immune response, presumably of the immune system. And I say presumably, uh, 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 
Uh, actually, no, I, 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 we, we know that because if we silence the complement system, you can see that in this column of pictures here, then we recover all the parasites that have been invading the, uh, the gut epithelium. And you see that again here on this graph. So molecules, whether they are involved in developmental processes or not, uh, and uh, uh, that have, um, uh, that show a role in, um, in uh, uh, have a role in, in, in successful invasion and formation of oocysts seem to be protecting the parasites from uh, the complement system. Let me just go a little bit further with one of these molecules. This is a GPI uncode uh, uh, protein called C43 or PIMS43. PIMS starts, uh, uh, stands for Plasmodium uh, Parasite Invasion uh, Screen uh, of, of the sort. I can't remember exactly how we figured that out. It sounds like a good name to give. So C43, you can see that it's present on the parasite on the kind surface, similar to this uh, uh, model molecule for the orkine surface, P28. And it's also uh, present on the surface of the sporozoids, which is the stage of parasites that is forming uh, in the oocyst. If you inactivate C43, then you get uh, no oocysts forming on the parasite gut. But when you inactivate the mosquito complement like system, uh, again, you recover all the parasites that have been invading the gut. And they are, all these parasites are able to form oocysts. You can see them here. In this case, however, this C43, because it is present on the sporozoid surface as well, it serves another role, a secondary function in the oocysts, uh, and the oocysts stay uh, small and they do not produce sporozoids, for, so we do not recover transmission. Okay, so um, the... Um, what we know about molecules that are involved in parasitism uh, is that these uh, molecules are undergoing, uh, when they're exposed to the host environment, they're undergoing directional selection uh, that facilitates the adaptation to new hosts. Uh, and these are molecules like P47, which is in the parasite surface, as I told you before, and uh, Carolina in the previous work has shown that there is directional selection for those uh, for the P47. Uh, and what we know also is that molecules that involve developmental and other housekeeping processes are subject to purifying selection, so uh, deleterious mutations are removed uh, uh, and uh, the function is retained. So we tested those uh, uh, experimentally and uh, for directional selection, we uh, took a, um, a data set of some thousands of parasites that have been created, that have been sequenced by the Malaria Gen Consortium and uh, found that indeed there is a high degree of allele differentiation between subpopulations uh, for both P47 that you see here. And again, we knew that uh, 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 from Carolina before, we showed it with a different uh, uh, set of parasites. There is high FST between West and East Africa. And for P47, not as high uh, differentiation as P47, uh, but also uh, differentiation, uh, which is a, bit, a little bit more complex. It's not just between East and West Africa, but it's also between uh, West and Central and East and Central Africa. We tested also uh, purifying selection, and we were able to do that in the lab. So we mixed, uh, 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 we created pools of mutant parasites. We parsed them through, we infected uh, uh, mice with these mutant parasites, and then we allowed uh, mosquitoes that were either wild type or they were missing uh, wild type in black, or they were missing the complement system or other parts of the immune system to uh, bite those mice. And then we were monitoring what goes 
out of these mosquitoes into new mice and what goes out of these mice into new mosquitoes who we are monitoring here. And then we saw that gradually all the deleterious mutations were removed uh, when the, um, uh, the parasite, when the immune system, it was not there, but when the immune system of the mosquito was silenced, uh, then the um, many of those, um, you can see that with the L, many of those were retained. So they were, uh, 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 they were persisting in the population, in the uh, uh, transmission system for much longer. So this is a confirmation that purifying selection is indeed happening on those molecules. <clears throat> so the, the, the conclusion from that was that the mosquito complement like system, which is, again, I emphasize, I cannot emphasize enough, is really important uh, uh, both in the lab and in the field in getting rid of parasites, this is what uh, the, our research has shown, uh, acts like a purifying selection for the parasite populations, removing parasites that are carrying lots of fitness mutations, uh, they are unfit, uh, and this happens uh, uh, during, uh, upon medical invasion, where the complement system functions. So, so the, 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 the take home message and our conclusion that, that we took forward, and I will come to the gene drive part, is that damaging parasites prior to medical invasion or compromising the or kind of tolerance to these immune responses can assist the complement mediated parasite clearance that we observed. So this is what we were set to achieve. How can we achieve that? Uh, uh, for example, we could, uh, one thing that we uh, decided to do uh, and, um, was to uh, express um, exogenous, exotic antimicrobial peptides in the gut of those mosquitoes. Uh, here we were investigating three antimicrobial peptides, peptides scorpion that comes from the scorpion, uh, melitin from the honeybee, and manganin from the Xenobus uh, uh, levis uh, skin. Uh, so uh, scorpion, we, we knew from our work uh, uh, of colleagues in the past that if you uh, produce it in the mosquito gut, it will uh, target, uh, it will kill malaria parasites. So what we did with melitin and manganin was to uh, synthesize them, uh, the peptides, provide them with the blood meal. And again, without going into the details, uh, and we did some modifications as well at the uh, car carboxy and amino terminus of these uh, peptides. We found peptides that are really good uh, uh, in uh, killing parasites or damaging parasites in the uh, mosquito gut uh, lumen. And when these parasites uh, uh, go through the uh, gut epithelium, they are killed now by the complement system. They are purified, the population is purified by the complement system. Um, another thing that we could do is, uh, and, uh, and we are uh, doing at the moment, we identify uh, endogenous antimicrobial peptides and repurpose them essentially, uh, 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 express them in the mosquito gut at the time that the parasite um, is, uh, uh, goes through the mosquito gut or is found in the gut lumen. And we know that if we inactivate those peptides, uh, then we have a higher number of parasites than in the control. This is something that we are starting at the moment. The other thing we could do is uh, to produce antibodies against uh, those uh, uh, molecules that are protecting the parasites from the mosquito immune response, neutralizing antibodies, uh, preventing the interaction between uh, the parasite and whatever they're interacting with in the host, in the mosquito. And you can see such a work here with a, uh, a neutralizing antibody against PIMS43 that is found again on the kind of surface, when we give PIMS43 antibodies in the gut lumen of those mosquitoes together with the blood meal, then we lower the uh, number of parasites that are able to, in a dose dependent manner, uh, that are able to go through the gut and form horses. So the idea here is to be, uh, is to produce uh, uh, those antibodies, either a single chain antibodies in the mosquitoes or in nanobodies uh, in genetically modified mosquitoes. 
So uh, at this stage, when we were uh, doing all that work, uh, uh, it was it came the opportunity to go to the next uh, step, essentially um, translate the knowledge uh, in uh, to uh, uh, population replacement methods, and we partnered with. Uh, uh, the uh, laboratory of uh, Nikolai Windbichler at the uh, at Imperial uh, and uh, with the support of the Gates Foundation, we started a program on mosquito population replacement, putting those concepts in, in, in action. Uh, I mean, you've heard a lot from previous speakers uh, uh, about uh, gene drive and how uh, population replacement can be done essentially is the, uh, we engineer non vector uh, properties uh, in those mosquitoes, and we inherit them in a super Mendelian fashion, uh, and so that they're quickly driven uh, through wild mosquito populations. And this has been enabled now, uh, uh, especially with, uh, with various tools, especially with CRISPR-Cas9 uh, uh, gene editing uh, or genome editing method. So uh, the goal in this case is that those mosquitoes that we have engineered uh, over time will uh, overtake uh, and will replace the, uh, the wild populations. And we have mosquitoes that cannot transmit uh, malaria anymore. The uh, standard way of, um, of mosquito population replacement, what we had been doing all these years, was that we create such strains in the lab where um, uh, there's, a, there's a construct that carries the effector and the drive as well. Let's say that the drive system is Cas9. Uh, we engineer those mosquitoes, we create these strains, and then the aim would be to introduce them in, uh, in the field uh, and, and test them in the field, either uh, uh, first test them and then deploy them in the field. In all these stages that you see here, there are various regulatory burdens, biological risks, so that would need to be uh, considered, uh, container requirements, etc. When we were designing our method, uh, we put down the challenges uh, uh, for, for such method. And uh, I mean, you all know them, but I'm listing them here. So the design of such constructs uh, 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 is difficult. They're large constructs, they're complex. Uh, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, the mosquitoes will carry a burden uh, to carry those constructs. Uh, we have to integrate them randomly on the, um, on the um, genome of the mosquitoes, or they, we have very little choice of the locus that we uh, want to integrate them. Um, there is a problem with the long-term efficacy and stability of this module, which uh, is the effector and the drive together. We can have resistance to drive, we can have resistance to the effector, we can have loss of the effector, we have a fitness cause and all that. Uh, I told you before about this huge regulatory uh, hurdle uh, that uh, with mosquito introducing mosquitoes in the field that are carrying the drive as well, so they cannot be easily tested in the field. Uh, when they're carrying the drive and they are, can operate at any time, the drive can operate at any time. Of course, we have huge problems with uh, appropriate effectors. I can say that we don't have the appropriate effector yet. Um, uh, but one of the limitations is uh, the uh, limited number of promoters that we have available to our disposal uh, to do all this, uh, um, uh, to express those effectors at the right time uh, and the right uh, place. Uh, and also, uh, the, most of the tests that we are doing that these effectors are effective are done in the lab, and we don't know whether this will be also effective against wild parasites. So, taking all this into consideration, we designed a new concept, uh, which we call the integral gene drive, uh, that has multiple various components in it. One of the components is the dissociation of the effector and the drive, uh, is what others would call the split uh, uh, system, uh, split drive. So uh, uh, you can generate a, a mosquito that has the effector component and then a different strain that has the drive component. And only when the two meet, the uh, effector will be homing and will be driven in the population. Uh, 
The second component of our design uh, has uh, what we call the minimum genetic modification or modifications that happen in situ. So uh, instead of uh, ask, uh, trying to find the appropriate uh, place to put the, or the appropriate promoter to put in front of the effector uh, uh, or the appropriate uh, uh, place in the genome to put the, uh, or select the appropriate place in the genome to put the construct, we are uh, uh, making the modifications in situ within host genes. For example, we want to express this effector in the carboxypeptidase locus in the gut of the mosquitoes. We will go and modify the carboxypeptidase gene in situ. We will hijack the carboxypeptidase gene. We will insert uh, the effector, a minimal and a very small fragment uh, uh, part, and I will come back to that. Uh, hopefully, I will have some more time to get back to this. Uh, and. Uh, and it, it, by doing and the same we do with the Cas9, instead of just using the vessel that we have, the promoted vessel that we have, or uh, nanos or whatever else, we will uh, 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 go and integrate Cas9 uh, within the gene that we want to, uh, 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 to um, benefit from its expression properties. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, the third component, which is uh, inherent, in, in this system is that you can combine multiple drives and multiple effects at the same time, release them at the same time or in sequence or staggered releases. Uh, and, uh, uh, and you're not limited to a single effect or uh, linked to a single drive. We modeled uh, uh, with some preliminary modeling, uh, not very sophisticated modeling uh, this strategy. And indeed we uh, saw that from this preliminary and modeling that there's a substantially, we can substantially increase protection, even in the case that there is pre-existing resistance. And we model that with single effectors integrated somewhere or two effectors, um, one drive or more than one drive. Uh, and that the uh, duration of 95% protection is quite extended, is extended. It can go up to 81 generations if we have no pre-existing resistance or 15 generations if we have 10% pre-existing resistance, et cetera. I mean, there are various, various components, there are various uh, variables here. So our operational plan in, uh, in this program that we call Transmission Zero is that we create separate effectors and drives. We will introduce the effectors without the capacity to drive in the field. We'll test them with wild parasites in the field of course, there's a regulatory uh, 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 steps that we have to go through, uh, have to comply with. We cannot just introduce a GM uh, mosquito in the field, but we feel that they're much less than having the drive at the same time there. So we test them in the field, and only when we feel that uh, we have the best system to go with, we will uh, introduce the drive as well, and we can release them at the same time. Try them first, and then release them at the same time. Uh, in order to be able to do the field testing uh, uh, with wild parasites of those effector uh, uh, GM mosquitoes, we engineered. Uh, it took us about three years, but we are ready to go now. Uh, COVID was not uh, helpful at all as well. Uh, uh, we engineered a, a facility, a CO3 insectary facility that uh, is uh, mobile. It can be mobile, it's in a container. And there we will do all our tests. And uh, for that, we collaborated, we collaborate with the Ifakara Health Institute in Tanzania, where these facilities now will be uh, introduced, will be installed. And uh, hopefully in the next year, we will have the first uh, 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 GM mosquitoes being tested there with wild parasites, effector mosquitoes again. Okay, so. Uh, I presume, uh, uh, David, if you, if you wish, you can stop me at any time, but I have a, a couple of more slides just to show an example of uh, where uh, we are at the moment uh, with the first system that we, uh, we, we started to put together with this interrupt gene uh, 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 drive method. Uh, uh, we uh, selected, because we had the results from colleagues in the past, we selected the scorpion. Uh, to integrate scorpion in various geno genomic uh, loci. 
so you can see here scorpine, we split scorpine in the middle. I mean, it has an intro uh, uh, there. And then within the intro, we put a, um, a selectable marker, uh, a, a visual marker, a GFP driven by uh, uh, three PAX6 uh, promoter. Uh, and within the uh, intro, we have also the CAD RNA that we allow, will allow uh, in the presence of Cas9, will allow the uh, scorpine, uh, this uh, 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 module to hold and be integrated in the genome. And we modified three loci, the carboxypeptidase, genomic locus works on the 3R chromosome, the uh, alkaline phosphatase locus on the 2L, and the peritrophin 1 locus on the 2L, again, chromosome. So after we've done, we do that, the marker is excised because we put uh, locks P sites on either side of the, of the marker. Uh, we excise the marker, so the, uh, the intro becomes really short and it has one of the guide RNA, which is under the, uh, the U6 uh, promoter. And then, um, and uh, so, the, so it's a minimal, we remain with a minimal modification. In the case, uh, I should say that in the case of the uh, carboxypeptidase, uh, the uh, gene is fused, the, the effector is fused using a 2A on the, uh, to the gene, to the carboxypeptidase gene using a 2A peptide. Uh, the same is true for the, uh, for the alkaline phosphatase uh, uh, gene. In the case of the peritrophin, what we wanted to do, it was, it was to uh, have the, uh, the effector anchored on the peritrophin, so we directly fused it on the carboxy uh, uh, terminus of the uh, APR1 gene, of the peritrophin 1 gene. You can see here, uh, this is the expression, the RNA expression of the various uh, 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 things that we've tested. Uh, the scorpine expression on the splice side and the host gene uh, for the scorpine in the carboxypeptase locus, uh, in the AP2 locus, and in the uh, peritrophin 1 locus. And you can actually see what is important to note, note here without going into the details is that before we remove the, um, we remove the GFP that's somewhere here in the intron, then um, uh, scorpine is not expressed well, the splice, splicing is not happening, and the host gene is disrupted. And this is uh, uh, the same for almost all the constructs. You can see that here, for example, in the peritrophin 1 locus, scorpion is not expressed before we remove, because before we lock out uh, uh, the, uh, the GFP, uh, the same splicing is not happening uh, uh, efficiently, and the host gene is disrupted. Uh, so this disruption of the host gene is very important actually in our design. I forgot to say that before because the way that we design the construct is that uh, if there is any trouble in, uh, uh, with resistance and, and a frame shift in the whole process, then essentially the whole the mosquito will be unfit and it will die. So resistance will, uh, the chance for resistance will be uh, eliminated or it will be, it will be limited. Uh, here we are testing now the next step, which is crossing the constructs that we have, the mosquito lines that we have, with uh, a, a different line that carries the, vas the Cas9 under the VASA expression, the VASA gene expression in the, in, in the gen line. And what we see is that the homing uh, 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 rates uh, coming both from paternal and maternal Cas9 are almost 100% in all the cases. Here is with the GFP is still there before it is locked. Here is with the GFP uh, removed. The final, final construct for the AP2. We have transmission rate, homing rate close to 100%. And this is my last slide where we are testing, uh, we are testing the capacity of those mosquitoes to block transmission um, of uh, plasmodium falciparum. And again, is not a, a sterilizing, uh, uh, a sterilizing uh, um, uh, line that we have there. You can see that here, we still have many oocysts in all the constructs. But in the case of, uh, uh, 
of scorpion AP2 and the case of peritrophin uh, 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 scorpion, uh, we have reduction, a great reduction in parasite numbers, in osis numbers that are forming in the, uh, in, in the gut. In the case of the carboxypeptase scorpion, for reasons we cannot fully explain at the moment, and we have some ideas, we have an opposite effect. So the introduction of the effector uh, within the carboxypeptase locus uh, uh, gives results in more osis forming on the mosquito uh, uh, gut. I have to say uh, that uh, I do not personally, I, I do not believe this is a proof of concept. I do not believe personally, and none of us in transmission here believe that the scorpion can be a construct uh, or a line uh, that uh, can be used in population replacement, but it's, a, it, it's an ideal model system. Uh, all of our concepts that we put together seem to be working the way we wanted them to work. And I will finish here. Obviously, there are many people that must take the credits, and uh, I would like to thank them for that. Uh, the first part uh, of uh, understanding mosquito immunity, parasite mosquito interactions, uh, were uh, done uh, uh, with, uh, together with, um, uh, I mean, the many people were involved, and they were supervised together with uh, Dr. Dina Rathquad Imperial. Uh, the second part uh, with the Gene Drive uh, is a partnership with uh, uh, the group of Nikolai Winbichler at Imperial. Uh, I'm not going to mention all the people that are involved, uh, uh, but I can only say uh, one at the end. I mean, the last part uh, with the Scorpine, uh, which is a, a work that is still unpublished, is done by mostly by Astrid Herman uh, and, uh, and also Sofia Tapanelli. Uh, funding was provided through this year very generously by the Wellcome Trust and for the transmission of zero population replacement part by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And uh, I would like to stop here. I will be happy to answer questions. Uh, Dave, the, uh, up to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, we, we uh, let me encourage the, the attendees to begin asking their questions if they haven't already done so. I, I see we have some questions already. We'll get to those in just a second. So please, uh, again, let me encourage everybody to ask questions uh, of, of any nature. I did want to just start out myself with a question before I get on to some of the others. Um, you mentioned that there's no ideal uh, effector. And I just want to know if, what some of your thoughts are on how good things have to be um, in order for it to be effective. Is complete sterility a, a necessity or have people modeled out, you know, um, you know, based on our knowledge of how many sporozoites are needed to infect a human and how many bites and so on and so forth? Yeah, so I mean, that's a very good question. So uh, we are well, striving to complete sterility and, and I, I think that this is what we should be uh, uh, aiming to do. Uh, I, I mean, the models that we have and, uh, the, uh, and the experience that I have tell me that uh, reduction uh, of uh, the intensity might be very effective as well. We've done uh, several, uh, a lot of modeling in the past with natural infections, and it seems that there's a direct correlation between the transmission and the infection intensity that we see in a place uh, in, in mosquitoes. So again, we should be striving towards, uh, uh, and that's my personal feeling, we should be striving towards sterility, sterile immunity, uh, but uh, 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 a, a reduction to a, Good level. I mean, I cannot give a percentage, but uh, I mean, a good reduction should be enough to suppress uh, transmission. Uh, uh, and in combination with other uh, methods that we will be using, uh, I believe could lead to elimination in a place. I wouldn't say eradication, but could lead to elimination in a place. 
Great. Well, let's take some questions from uh, from some of the uh, people that are in the audience. Here's here's one from uh, Andrew Roberts, who says, thanks for a very informative presentation. This is clearly a very promising approach to reducing malaria transmission. However, based on our history with resistance development, it seems like it would be preferable to introduce at least two effectors together, uh, with effect, which affect different parts of the life cycle of the parasite in order to prevent resistance development. Is this part of the plan? Uh, if not, why would you not expect rapid resistance to the effector AMP to emerge uh, in the parasite population? Yeah, no, actually, it is, it is indeed part of the plan. I mean, I, I talked about the possibility, which is uh, is integral in our integral gene drive uh, concept of uh, uh, releasing many effectors at the same time. Um, it could be one at a time, it could be one first, and then another one afterwards. I mean, it would be better if they're together, so you, you uh, reduce the chance of resistance. It would be even better if they are targeting different parts of the parasite. Uh, uh, we started now focusing on the OSI stage as well. Uh, I believe the combination of an effector uh, produced uh, uh, against the, uh, the, the, gut, the gut lumen stages and against the sporozoids uh, might be uh, the most appropriate combination. Uh, the, um, it also, I mean, the, the design, uh, and, I, and, I, and I failed to mention that the design that we have uh, could also allow a combination between replacement and suppression methods because the, the, the drive could be uh, one, and then you could combine uh, uh, effector strains that are uh, uh, leading towards suppression and towards uh, uh, population uh, replacement as well. So that's why we believe that we, we strongly believe that the, uh, the split method can serve multiple purposes at, at the same time. Great, thanks. I have another question here. This one's from uh, Mike Smansky. Um, and the question is, since mosquito complement system has a purifying effect on plasmodium by selectively removing less fit parasites, would knocking out this system in a population of wild mosquitoes yield populations of parasite that are less pathogenic? Uh, yeah, I mean, possibly. That would be very dangerous. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, presumably, I mean, it would uh, knocking out the uh, the uh, the complement system uh, might have uh, a transient increase of uh, malaria uh, transmission, but in the longer term may have a detrimental effect. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't test that though. Uh, I would be very reluctant to propose such a thing. Uh, let me say here, uh, this gives me a chance to say that our thoughts initially is that because the complement system is so effective, uh, is that we could possibly boost it a little bit more. So give it some, uh, 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 I mean, overexpress it a little bit or uh, suppress the, the negative regulators. Or, but the results that show that it has this purifying selection actually led us to uh, the uh, conclusion that it would not do anything. And in fact, uh, uh, lines of uh, uh, overexpressing TEP1 in the hemolymph uh, did not uh, achieve any, uh, any better blockage of parasites. So that's why we concluded that the only way to go is to damage the parasite, in this case, is to damage the parasites prior to uh, uh, facing the complement system. So that when the, they face the complement system, they are cleared by the, by the system. Right. Okay, let's go on to uh, another question here. This question is from Ava. Ava, I apologize for not being able to uh, pronounce your last name, but uh, Ava says, uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you have regulatory approval already for your experiments to be conducted in Tanzania? And are you planning for field releases there or contained lab studies only? Uh, that's that's very early. No, no, we do. So, so the first, first and first, so we don't have a regulatory approval at the moment. So we are going through uh, regulatory paths uh, uh, currently. Uh, now what we are doing, as I said, we are introducing the mobile sector uh, there. We will be testing... Uh, system infecting uh, uh, 
mosquitoes, wild type mosquitoes, local mosquitoes with malaria parasites. Uh, we will be uh, testing our effectors, but not engineered in mosquitoes. For example, we'll be testing nanobodies against uh, some of the molecules we're working with provided through the blood mill. Uh, we will be testing uh, peptides uh, of uh, uh, antimicrobial peptides provided through the blood mill, but not engineering the mosquitoes. Uh, and at the same time, we're going through this regulatory approval process. Hopefully, we can have it within a year or so. Um, now, the second question, whether we are planning uh, field trials, uh, I mean, that's further down the line. Yes, of course, I mean, the, the path leads to uh, 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 trials, um, fail, first uh, uh, big cage trials, uh, and uh, also trials with uh, limited gene drive, uh, self-eliminated gene drive, uh, and I can explain more in which uh, how we can do that. Uh, and then at the end, uh, uh, large uh, field trials. But this is much down the line. I, we can't see that actually in the next three to five years. It will be, it will be beyond that. Okay, thanks. Um, here's a question from uh, uh, Yan Yan. And uh, could you elaborate more on how to find novel antimicrobial peptides? What's the different? What's the difference between antimicrobial peptides and other antiparasite molecules? Thanks. Well, antimicrobial peptides is a is a specific term for um, parasite, but it's very broad as well for uh, uh, peptides that uh, damage microbes one way or another. So they're usually small peptides. Uh, they usually set themselves on the parasite membrane and they open holes on the membrane or they change the potential of the mem membrane or they insert themselves inside the cytoplasm and they bind to several uh, uh, organelles or molecules, for example, on the ribosome or uh, other uh, uh, organelles and, 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 and molecules and they prevent their function. So now, I mean, of course, we can classify all the rest as antimicrobial peptides, um, antiparasitic molecules uh, as antimicrobial peptides. Personally, uh, I don't know any antiparasitic molecule at the moment that is not an antimicrobial peptide. Uh, I, I mean, the results that we, all the findings that we have so far point to a non-specific response of mosquitoes against parasites. So there's, so there's no antiparasitic molecule per se. Uh, they are, there are generic molecules uh, that perform antimicrobial functions. and They can be targeted against the parasites as well. Um, so, which it brings actually a caveat, which we should discuss here as well, that when you do express an antimicrobial peptide in the mosquito gut, let's say in the mosquito gut, it could be in the mosquito hemolymph, you should expect that it will uh, affect also other microbes, such as bacteria. So it will disrupt homeostasis. Uh, it could also uh, affect, and we know that uh, antimicrobial peptides do that, they could affect also host cells and will compromise uh, fitness of, of those uh, uh, mosquitoes. So con concluding, uh, there's no difference between antiparasitic peptides and or antiparasitic peptides and antimicrobial peptides. Now, the, um, the nanobodies that I, uh, I described or the antibody antibodies, these will be antiparasitic molecules, right? So they will be specific for the parasite. They will not do anything to uh, other microbes. But this is a different class. I mean, they're not peptides. Thanks. Have uh, more questions here. Uh, this one's from uh, Bill Reed. And uh, the question is, what considerations do, do you have for the insertion position of transgenes in the intron? And if I could just sort of riff off of that, if Bill doesn't mind, I think he's, you know, the, 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 the lack of 
the, the uh, splice phenotype that you saw at the end with your GFP and the intron was was interesting. Well, yes, I mean, they, so we have it, we have it, we inserted a huge construct with a promoter and the GFP with that intron. Uh, and what we observed is that splicing doesn't happen if this is what you mean. Uh, we feel that uh, it has to do with uh, how big the intron is and, uh, and then reducing the intron down to its natural size, then it will be, it, it comes back uh, uh, to, uh, you know, to action. I mean, to, uh, splicing is happening. Um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm answering the right question there. Yeah, I think it was a, it was an issue. It was a technical question. I think uh, towards the design of the insertion site within an intron uh, when you were putting your the introns that we introduced. In the that we well, no, they are actually so. So uh, let me let me see. So the the guide RNA is not targeting an intron, right? So the guide RNA is targeting the uh, uh, the uh, the genes. So because we're trying to fuse the effectors. Uh, or uncut the effectors on the on the protein. For example, on the CP, we are fusing the CP with the effector, right? So, so, uh, so the guide RNA is not targeting an intron. What we have in the intron, which we is an intron that we know and we introduce in all our effectors, is that uh, we we have the uh, uh, the, the marker, the fluorescent marker that will allow us the transformation marker that will allow us to select the lines. And then once the line is established, we just remove it. We cross it with the Cree, uh, Cree line. We remove it, we introduce the LOX P size, we remove that, and then only minimal modification remains. And this reconstitute both the expression of um, <clears throat> the effector as well as the, as well as the expression of the host gene. Thanks, Bill. Bill, if I've muddled that question for you, uh, maybe you could write a, a follow up and and uh, and be happy to take that. Uh, here's another question. Here's a question from uh, Yume Dong. Um, this I think you partially covered already, but uh, Yume says thanks. Uh, are you developing single chain antibodies targeting PIMS forty three uh, into your effector molecule, including several AMPs such as SCORP B? So we are developing antibodies, single chain antibodies and nanobodies targeting PIMS43. We haven't done them, we don't have them yet. We are developing them. Uh, we are also having the pipeline a few other molecules that we are developing uh, single chain antibodies uh, against. Uh, and we are expressing, we have uh, lines that are expressing the rest of the uh, effectors. Uh, melatonin, manganin, or a combination of them in different loci. Uh, we're targeting the peritrophin, the CP, the AP, the antimicrobial peptide uh, genes, uh, etc. So we're inserting them there. We have some data, preliminary data, that show that uh, uh, suggest that some of that, a combination of those, might be very uh, effective uh, and uh, providing close to sterile immunity. But this is very uh, preliminary. Uh, so in the there are lots in the pipeline, uh, but at the moment, what uh, what is uh, what we know is that is what I showed about scorpion that the expression of scorpion at least in these three loci does not provide sterile immunity. It can provide some reduction, but not sterile immunity. We haven't tested any of the nanobots or single single chain antibodies. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And thank you, May, for this question. Um, George, we've got a, a couple, still have a couple more questions here and we have some time, so let's, let's keep going. Um, here's a question from uh, Moez Khan. Uh, the question is, what are the biggest challenges that you face when obtaining regulatory approval for these experiments and for releasing gene drives in general? What criteria do governments expect you to meet for approval? Oh, well, that's, uh, I mean, I can't say because we're at the very beginning, possibly the best uh, person to ask would be Hector or, 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 or Dave in that case. So, I mean, there are lots of challenges down the line. I mean, we, we go through them at the moment. It has to do with risk. It has to do with uh, uh, 
uh, adverse uh, risks that we don't, we cannot really predict about. Um, it, it has to do with containment. Um, uh, it has to do with uh, 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 environmental assessments. I mean, how 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 far it can spread in the environment. Uh, uh, it has to do with biodiversity, uh, I mean, all sorts of things. I mean, uh, it's a huge list. Naturally, it's a, it's, a, it's, a non, it's, a non, it's an unknown list. I mean, you have to just, you know, map the risks in every possible direction, really. And uh, the other challenge, I guess, the major challenge is when you are going through the regulatory approval. I mean, again, I'm saying we haven't gone through. So, so uh, others that have done this before, possibly Tage Malaria and Andrea can can say uh, uh, more things uh, in the next webinar, um, will be to engage with the right people and the right bodies in every country that you're trying to, uh, to introduce those, uh, uh, those mosquitoes. Uh, it's, uh, you have to have the community approval, you have to have the, the public approval, you have to have the, 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 uh, the state approval uh, and uh, uh, engaging both with scientists and community leaders would be a major uh, would be a major challenge in order for you to get uh, approval for your work. Uh, uh, I mean, it could be both uh, both uh, formal approval, but it could be also the, the public uh, uh, perception of what you are you are doing. Uh, I mean, you should ask me this question in a year from now. I, I'm, I'm sure I will I will list thousands of challenges that one uh, must go through. Great. And uh, I guess this is our, our final question. Uh, and this is a follow up question from Ava earlier. Um, and she says, thank you. Can you please explain further the, the limited gene drives that you would release uh, as you suggested? Uh, yeah, actually, I mean, there, there are lots of ways of, of, of doing that. Uh, so one way that we are thinking at the moment is that uh, the drive cannot drive itself. So, I mean, in the, in the, at the end of the process, what you want is uh, a, a drive that is driving itself on, on, on wherever you put it, in its homing, wherever you put it, let's say in the vasa locus, and a, a, an effector that is driven by the drive, by the simple cut line in, let's say, the CP locus. Um, so uh, the limited uh, drive or the self, um, I don't know how we, I mean, there, there is a, there is a, term, a term, but it doesn't, doesn't come to me at the moment. So essentially it vanishes by, with the time itself. I mean, it's a self-limited self -limited drive. Um, the, uh, what we are doing, what we're thinking of doing now is that we will not allow it to drive itself. So we release them at the same time uh, and the drive will disappear. Uh, uh, over time, in a few generations, Cas9 will disappear in a few generations because it cannot be driven, uh, but it will help drive the effector. And we've done some uh, 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 work in the lab uh, with uh, trials and uh, cage, cage experiments, and it seems that it's really very effective. It can, it can lead to very high transmission rates of the, of the effector, and the drive disappears over, after a few generations, disappears completely. Okay, great. Well, uh, that was our last question. I'd like to uh, encourage all of our, our listeners to thank, thank George for his uh, presentation. And uh, let me just, uh, before we leave, I'd just like to make a few comments. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank George for uh, for the presentation and uh, the really interesting work and to see how all of the immunology that has developed over the years and now it's being applied to uh, uh, potentially being applied in, in, a, in a very useful way. So thanks again, George, for taking the time to, to do this and uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you to the attendees and for the questions. Very much appreciate the, the questions and your attendance. Want to remind you that we'll be uh, here again next week at the same time and place. Uh, our next webinar speaker will be Andrea Crisanti, also from Imperial College, who's uh, engaged in some very interesting work on gene drives and gene drive development programs. Uh, he'll be talking about Anopheles Gamby population suppression GEV drive techniques. So with, with that, I'd like to thank George one more time and uh, thank you, the viewers and the attendees, and hope to see you here next week. Thank you very much.